All right, now let's look at fight enders. We're gonna be taking a look at how to subdue, control, and if necessarily, necessary, severely injure your attacker. I'm gonna cover a couple topics here that are related to each other. We're gonna be primarily looking at joint locks, submission holds. They're the things that require the most practice and I wanna give you the most details. At the same time, we'll look at how various strikes fit in, but our main focus is gonna be on joint locks. Now, the first thing I want to begin with is the idea of there is a joint hierarchy. And what I mean by that is that from a jiu-jitsu point of view, as somebody using joint locks to defend myself, I want to understand that attacking different joints becomes more dangerous as we work our way up. So at the end of his body, we have fingers. You can lock and twist fingers and break them, but it's not going to have a big impact. That You can't really consider these fight enders, although a lot of people, not a lot, but a few people are out there teaching that, that if you're being attacked with knives and guns and in serious life-threatening situations, you should be playing this little piggy. It's ridiculous. So we can use fingers at low to medium threat levels, and we'll take a look at that, but we want to understand that if you take a joint lock to its natural conclusion, what's going to happen? If I broke his finger, what's going to happen? It's going to cause pain. He's got four more good ones. I've seen people when I was a kid get fingers cut off and they just went, oh, I've got to go to the hospital. People don't fall down and die because of an injured finger. Then we move to the wrist. Now, if you injure the wrist, it's going to incapacitate the hand. It's, uh, it can be useful again for low to medium threat scenarios, but it's generally not considered a fight stopper in the same way that the next joints up are. When we go to the elbow, the elbow can cause cat catastrophic injury to the arm. It's more difficult than people think, and we, we covered that in uh, the joint lock section on the arm lock, but if you injure the elbow sufficiently, it's going to incapacitate the whole arm. Then we move up to the shoulder. The shoulder is plugged into the body, so unlike the uh, the elbow, you're actually going to dysfunction the whole side of his body. If you've ever seen a broken clavicle or a torn rotator cuff like I had years ago playing rugby, basically the whole side of your body goes limp and you're not able to use it. So if the shoulder's injured enough, you're going to basically cut off this side of him. Now as we move to the neck, the neck is both where the spine is exposed, but it's also the airway. So obviously if I injure the neck severely, you can cause paralysis and death. But the airway is considered the most efficient place to attack, and I want to talk about that at length a little bit here. Nowadays, there's a lot of people marketing pressure points and weak points and things like that. Uh, in the real world, I've never seen it function. And even in academy conditions, no one's ever shown me any pressure points that convinced me it was anything more than, than hooey. But if you're looking for a weak point, from a jiu-jitsu point of view, the most proven and efficient weak point of the human body is the airway, the neck. Now, I'm not talking about striking the throat, which a lot of people advocate, but what I'm talking about is choking somebody unconscious. It's one of the few ways that a really small person can genuinely defend themselves against somebody larger and stronger. If you're a 105 pound female, physics simply dictates that you may never have enough force to be able to kick and punch somebody and cause unconsciousness. But if you get your arms in the right position, you're pretty much guaranteed with the training that you can choke somebody unconscious. So we want to be looking a lot at chokes if we want to have a truly realistic and efficient way for smaller people to defeat larger and stronger ones. So to reiterate, what we're talking about is a hierarchy of joints along the body. At the end are the smallest and weakest ones, but they're also going to have the least effect. So fingers are basically just nuisance holds for low levels of threat. Then we go to the wrist. The wrist can be effective. It can be used more as a way to put someone on the ground but uh, it's difficult to really incapacitate the wrist the way you might like because of the way it's built. It's a series of interlocking ligaments and, and bones there, and you'd probably have to work on it a lot harder than you realize to actually truly dysfunction. Now the elbow is a simple hinge joint. It, if you hyperextend it and then lock it out, you start spreading the muscles on the inside here, and it, it can incapacitate the whole arm. Then the shoulder, if you injure it enough, it's gonna incapacitate the whole side of the body, and then we get to the neck, if you injure the neck severely enough, it would cause death. And of course, probably the most efficient, yet one of the more humane places to attack is the actual airway, which we're going to be looking at.